avant-garde. Nous devons toujours aller avant-garde. Pour ou même qu'à l'avant-garde, consultez Jean-Claude Sanon, n'importe qui l'est dans 617 839 71 91. Toujours à l'avant-garde avec Jean-Claude Sanon, nous offrons tout service immigration avec accident. Nous remplis toute forme, nous mettez en forme. L'aide pour toute occasion ou circonstance, interprétation médicale légale, qu'à docteur dans l'hôpital, qu'à avocat dans le tribunal, sans compter immigration, traduction toute qualité papier, certificat, acte de naissance, de mariage, de décès. Service de traduction, c'est même joie. L'aide pour demander visa devant ambassade, discours, docteur public, officier d'état civil pour marier ou. Real estate, vendre à cacher caille, mettre cérémonie pour toute occasion, c'est Jean-Claude Salon. Non affilié à un bureau avocat en Haïti qui travaille serré serré à Kachib National et Tribunal. Service vite passé vent pour jugement, acte de naissance tardive, acte de naissance tenant lieu, acte de décès, acte de divorce. Nous fait divorce tout sans qu'on pas besoin de payer ticket pour l'Haïti. Acte d'adoption, acte de mariage, civil ou religieux, extrait acte de naissance et de mariage rapide. Do presto, bon bagaille sans problème devant immigration reconnue par l'État haïtien. Sans faux pas, consultez avant-garde. Jean-Claude Salon, dans 617 839 71 91. Nous opérons seulement sur rendez-vous dans le nouveau local numéro 11 avec ce street Malapen Mass. Mes amis, mais James, il était étonné pour l'apprendre que tension est gros. Ça qui a fait l'y fait tension? Qui donc, il était parlé à docteur au sujet d'un chemin qui est bon pour santé, pour le cas de tension. Il était suspendu de fumer, ça qui fait une grosse différence dans les gens qu'elle bat en général. Il diminue la quantité de sel tout. Et puis, si vous avez étiquette sous manger, qui indique la quantité de sel. En plus de ça, il marche 30 minutes, 5 fois par semaine, régulièrement. Tout le ça qui est bon pour santé, il pas de facile. Même si vous tension, c'est vos efforts. Si vous avez plus d'informations concernant le chemin qui est bon pour santé, ça, pour vous joindre aide pour le cas de suspendre de fumer, relais 1 800 784 86 I would say it's always a pleasure. You're going to tell me, man, you are being so repetitive. You're always saying the same thing. But you know what? Listen, I only speak from the heart. Welcome to the bridge. And the bridge being brought to you certainly by Forum Communautaire, N4ED.net, Camera Mosaic, Radio Concorde, MCTV of Boston. My name is Jean Claude Sanon, your host. And today we're going to have a very dynamic conversation with one of our co-hosts, who this time is a guest in our program, <laughs> David Albert, who is here with us. And we're going to be going a little bit deep because we've got to find out where this boy from Chicago came from and how did he end up here in Boston and so on and so forth. This is what we'll do. But just remember that the bridge is to honor, certainly, the legacy of people like Yves Nambourville and as well as Franz Kevo, who are my two mentors who have really helped shape it and ship me the way that I am today. I would also grant it to uh, one of our first senators who passed away. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I'll tell you one thing though, he, he was more than a mentor to me, and, and I certainly want to honor him too as well. Uh, what do they call it? I must have a memory lapse. But however, David is so good, he's gonna remember who we are talking about because he recently was buried and the funeral took place the, not long ago over at the Jubilee Church. Uh, this is where our first black senator, who was really a mentor to a lot of black people here in Boston, because he has established and done so much. And I'm quite sure that David would love to leave a similar legacy, if not even better, because very often we want to do what uh, our ancestors have done and, and do a little bit much better. How are you, my brother? Doing well, doing well. I think it was Senator Bill Owens. Bill Owens. That, you were that, that is, of. that yes, is, that and, is. And he that. did, and you were absolutely right. You know, Senator Owens, like so many folks who come before him, yes. have really, yeah. they fought. They fought and they bled often, mm -hmm. and they took their time and uh, had to take on a lot of often indignities, a lot of disrespect yes, to sir. make a place yes, and sir. a way for yes, folks sir. like you and I to be involved true, in true. civic life here in the city and, of course, throughout the country, so you know, we ask him, you know, rest in power, rest in honor, Senator Owens, and thank you for all that you've done for so many all across the city, across generations. Yeah, and we ought never to forget what our forefathers have done because they've paved the way, as you've said. Now let's roll into what David 
I'm going to always say David. I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> without French uh, uh, inside of me, so I have a tendency to say David instead of, especially I have a brother-in-law who's David that yeah, I call him all the time, know. so that's understandable. Now, take the opportunity to really tell this audience, who is this young man that I'm bringing around? Who is he? What, what has he done? Who is he about? Absolutely. Well, one, I thank you for you know considering me still a young man at <laughs> 41. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> but it's okay, as you said. You know, from the Midwest, different sea city though, Cincinnati. So we were okay, all okay, very okay. excited about the Super Bowl at my house. A little disappointed, but okay. It's always next season. We'll see. But as I said, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and moved to Massachusetts when I was a kid. When I was in fourth mm -hmm. grade, so I moved to Framingham, Massachusetts, around this time of year, actually. Framingham. Moved, yeah. yeah Framingham. That's so nice. I, I moved during okay. uh, winter break that year, and I remember we came here in our minivan. We <laughs> drove up from the side, <laughs> myself, my mother, my two younger sisters. My aunt was already living here at the time. That's quite a ride. Yeah, it was yeah. about eighteen hours, a long ride, long, long ride. But we got here and. You know, we're driving, on, I'll never forget, we're driving on the Mass Pike heading eastbound. And, you know, we've never been here before and we didn't know anything. And all we knew was we were moving to a town called Framingham. And we didn't know anything about it. And we're At the time, it was town of Framingham. It was right the town now, of Framingham, yes. It's it the city, city of Framingham. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And so we see this sign and it says, Worcester Framingham. Now, we're all little kids. We don't drive. We don't understand really how the signs work. We just know it says Framingham. And mm -hmm. we're like, we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here. We're at our house. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is where that sign is on the pike is about 25 miles until you get to the uh, Framingham no, exit. Really. So my poor mother had to sit there. We're like, I thought we were in Framingham. We saw the <laughs> sign. Where are we going to get to our house? But we finally got there and yeah. we settled in uh, at a very, very cold winter day. And the next week I started my life really here in uh, Massachusetts and have been here ever since. So I grew up in Framingham for that part of my childhood, graduated from high school there and went to college for undergrad. And I went to Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in North Adams, Mass. And while I was there, I got very involved in student government. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of serving as the student representative for all public higher education students on the Board of Higher Education. And most importantly, I met a very nice young woman from Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, who became my Not too far from family. Not too far, yeah. too far. And that young woman and I uh, are still together here uh, about 20 years later as mm -hmm. of April. So okay. uh, my wife, then girlfriend, now wife, uh, Lauren, and I are the proud parents of two beautiful little girls, Amira, who's six, and she's a Boston Public School student herself, and Ophelia, who's three, and hopefully in about two weeks we'll find out if she gets to be a Boston Public School student <laughs> next year. Yeah. Uh, but being at school and being involved in you know those public sector areas, and public policy in particular, really sparked something in me. I was an English major. I thought I was going to do something mm. in communications. And my actually original goal when I went to college was to be in public relations for the Red Cross because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be very, very interesting. And so that's what I studied. But you know, government and policymaking really, really got inside of me and made me want to give back. And so that's where my career has largely gone. So I left, came to Boston, uh, moved to East Boston, mm -hmm. where I lived for about 14 years almost and had the privilege of working for a number of amazing individuals. So my first job was actually at the state treasurer's office, um, but I've had the privilege of working for folks like Governor Deval Patrick and city councilors. I Sam, think this is where we crossed paths the was, first time. Was, right, yes. Yeah. And city councilor Sam Yoon and John Tobin, uh, among others, many, many others. And you and I met when we were both in the first class for the Initiative for Diversity exactly. and Civic Leadership, right, along right, with right. many people, including Tito Jackson. Tito Jackson was among them. Yes, class. he's yeah, a good yeah, friend. Yeah. So, you know, that heart towards civic engagement is something that I grew up around. My mother was a longtime career professional at the Environmental Protection Agency. That's what brought us to Massachusetts in the first place. And I learned a lot from seeing her up close and personal in terms of her work and not just the you know, glamorous parts that are on the front page of the globe <laughs> today, but the real work that has to go in to make change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she has been my example for all of that. She helped found the Urban Environmental Program in New England. I so I remember joining her you know, on breaks and things like that where we'd be in Boston around you know, Dudley, uh, back when it was Dudley, okay. you know? okay. uh, going down to Providence, going to Hartford, going to environmental justice communities when I didn't really, and nobody was really talking about environmental justice communities uh, in the broader context. Like and the now. whole concept of climate change was just probably in the way back burn. Oh, way, way <laughs> back, way, way back. You know, we weren't even thinking about things. Like it. It, it, that was when recycling was still new back then, okay. right? Okay. So to see where we've come from an environmental standpoint, we still have quite a distance to go. 
um, but I learned that, you know, uh, working with her and seeing the work that she did and her colleagues and seeing how important it was that you have people that stand up for communities that have far too often felt like they've been either looked past or, or neglected. Or yeah. neglected, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to bring that with me into the work that I did professionally, as I said, working in government, uh, in the work that I did in my community, you know, through programs like IDCL and being involved in different boards and commissions all throughout. And then we've moved since then, so now we're no longer in East Boston. We still have a big heart for the community, uh, mm -hmm. our whole family, but we're uh, proud residents of Dorchester now, continuing to be involved. So I'm uh, currently serving on the boards for Pierce Park Advisory Council in East Boston and okay. East Boston Main Streets, staying connected to that neighborhood. But I also serve on the board for the Greater Mattapan Neighborhood Council uh, in okay. my new neighborhood. And so it's not that new. We've been here there almost mm -hmm. four years mm -hmm. now. Uh, but it's a wonderful. And all those experiences and working particularly at City Hall has just given me a very different perspective on the city as a whole. And that's what inspired me to try to step up my ability to help others and run for a seat on the city council. So I ran in 2019. I made it to the final round. Uh, unfortunately, didn't make it onto the council mm -hmm. that year, finishing in eighth place, but you know, I was inspired, inspired by the love that people showed me, but more importantly, by the trust that so many people placed in me, by casting their votes for me, and more importantly, the people that I met every day knocking on doors and having phone conversations, right. and hearing right. their stories, hearing their concerns, mm -hmm. hearing the things that were making them worried about the future of their city, of their place in this city. And two years later, so last year, 2021, I decided I'd try to run again. Uh, in between, I worked at MIT at the Educational Justice Let me tell you, let, let me just stop you there. Stop, and, stop. and And, and I want to tell folks how I appreciate this when, uh, I'll say when young people, oh, but when, when folks in general get involved into politics and they only want to give it a try. I don't like this attitude. And, and I'm going to find out later on what if you are serious if you're going to come back. So granted to say that when I saw you trying the second time, I really find a little bit of myself in you because consistency is certainly going to tell you what if this person is going to be a true leader or not. Because there are folks that just try politics for the sake of trying, but there are folks that are in love with it. So which is one of the aspects that I've admired out of your second trial. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, we had a, a much better run in 2021. Uh, I received endorsements from labor organizations, from elected officials, from the Boston Globe Editorial Board, which actually also endorsed me in 2019. And unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to finish just where we needed to. So I missed out. I was in fifth place, needed to be in the top four from one of the four citywide seats, but I missed it by 311 votes. So less than one tenth of one percent of the electorate. Uh, and it's, you know, I. I won't lie, it was a little bit disappointing, of course, but I look back on that fondly. You know, I had the privilege, and it was a privilege, to run in every corner of the city, to meet people whose stories started here and had been here for generations, people who had just arrived here mm -hmm. in our city from places all across the country, all across the world, and to think about what this city could be what it needs to be in the future, not just for those of us who are here, who are doing our thing as you know, adults, but I look at my daughters, my six-year-old, my three-year-old, and thinking about the kind of Boston that I want them to grow up in, mm -hmm. the kind of Boston that I want them to hopefully, if they choose to, to stay in and to live in and to grow and to thrive, and all of the kids that are just like them all across the city. So I, it was uh, an incredible experience you know, to do it, to run. Uh, I thank every single person who put their faith in me, whether it was you know, giving a dollar to the campaign or knocking on a door or making a phone call. You know, I always say you put so much of yourself as a candidate, of course, your family put so much into it uh, you know, in a campaign. It can, can be very, very difficult, it particularly is. with small children. It, it, it is. It's not can be. It is. <laughs> it is very difficult. Isn't it? But also, all of those people who care about the city and who believe in you and believe that you can be helpful, not just to them in the specific things that they need, mm -hmm, but really mm -hmm. in crafting that vision for right. what the future of the city is going to be. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a lot more to be thankful for, I always say, than to I be disappointed you. about. I get you. Uh, uh, we will be looking into the Val Patrick, uh, who lasted about eight years. I don't know how, how long were you in there for uh, how was that experience for you, uh, which is your first coming into politics? Yeah, I'd been involved in, with politics a little bit before that. So, okay. you know, working, as I said, at the treasurer's office out of college, 
was serving on the Board of Higher Education while I was a student. Um, you know, and then for me, it was an incredible experience working for Governor Patrick. Because, you know, not surprising, as a black man, you know, a young black man, seeing someone who shared in some ways those cultural touchstones, those experiences, good and bad, you know, doing that at such a high level and inspiring people all across the board, people who looked like us, people who didn't look anything like us at all, right? It was an incredible experience, not just because I had the privilege to serve as a volunteer in, during the campaign and then, of course, joining the administration in the first year, uh, something I look back on fondly, but also the connections that I made and the friendships, more importantly. You know, there's individuals, and it's wild to think that it's over 15 years ago that the Patrick campaign happened, the first Patrick campaign. And now so many of the folks that you know, I was up with knocking on doors or hanging up signs or being at rallies with, you know, we're all parents now, many of us. We're married. Uh, we have careers. You know, my friend Claire Kelly, who was just named as the director of intergovernmental relations for Mayor Wu. Uh, friends like you know, Chris Dempsey, who's running for state auditor right now. It's so wonderful to see all these people who many of them got their start in politics you know, during that campaign, in the early days of that administration, and all the wonderful things they've done, and all the people that they've been able to help over this time, and people who were, like me, inspired by the governor. Well, I think certainly it was a privilege. There's no doubt about it, because I think a lot of young people would have enjoyed the privilege of, of having someone who was liked and to this office to work with because that really uplift the moral, it uplift the ambitions and so on and so forth. And I think that's, that, that that's certainly can be helpful. Uh, during that time, did you have any intentions at all of running for public office while you were together with Val Patrick? You know, I thought about it, um, but in kind of that off-putting way of like, oh, maybe down the line, maybe in the future. You know, for me, public service has always been about what are you giving and how are you giving? And also making sure that you're being respectful of people. You know, you're asking a lot out of people, not just yourself, not just those immediately around you, but every single person you encounter if you do decide to run for office. And so I've always been of the belief that, you know, you should never run because of ego, just because of ego, just because you want to see your name on a sign or in a story in the newspaper or anything like that. You should run if you think that you have a real chance, right? Because you shouldn't waste people's time and mm -hmm. money that way. And it is really important. There's nothing guaranteed in politics. We know that. You can run the best campaign in the world. You can be the smartest person. You can have the best consultants. You can have the greatest connection. And you can still lose. It happens. It happens more often than not. You know, the majority of candidates don't win their races. But I think as long as you have a real pathway that you can see, uh, that you can really speak to about how you get from the point where you are to that point where you're raising your hand in victory on election day, then that means you're doing it for the right reasons and respecting people. And I think that it has to be foundational to anybody who's running for office. And so for me, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, if I get to a point where I feel like I actually do have that legitimate shot, and more importantly, that I'm in a place where whatever role I seek, whatever seat I'm going after, I can really do more to help other people, then maybe I'll make that decision. But it wasn't something that I felt I had to do, but something that I thought I wanted to do at some point. And then, of course, down the line, when 2019 came around, I thought I had reached that moment, and that's why I threw my hat in the ring. While running for public office, uh, very often that we have to hit different turfs and territories. Uh, and, you know, the diversity of the city of Boston, so there is no doubt about it, it can be... It can be hard uh, penetrating certain territories, uh, which group of people were a little bit more acceptable to your invitations than others. Yeah, I think every candidate finds kind of a, a natural constituency, a natural base. Uh, you know, running at large in Boston is interesting because you're running across 22 different wards, 255 precincts. You're running across the length and the breadth of the entire city. So you have to work to talk to everybody. You know, one of the most important experiences that I had when thinking about that run, and more importantly, how I wanted to campaign and how I would hope to serve as a counselor, was my experience working for Sam Yoon. You know, he was the first Asian American ever to be elected to the Boston City Council. Uh, he was Korean American. So Boston's two mm -hmm. largest Asian American populations are the Chinese American community and the Chinese community and the Vietnamese American and the Vietnamese community. And he wasn't a part of either of those. 
So for him, both in terms of political success, but also in terms of how he carried himself, it was really about doing everything that he could to uplift those folks who he knew didn't have a voice often, but to make sure that he showed every person in every community that he was going to be working for them. Some people were more natural in terms mm -hmm. of their gravitation mm -hmm. towards him than that, and so that's what I took to heart. Now, if you ask who were those people oftentimes who were gravitating towards me, um, you know, I, I think of really the progressive community here in the city of Boston. And it encompassed a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, but groups like Progressive West Roxbury and Rosendale, or the Jamaica Plain Progressives, or Right to the City Vote, um, these kind of forward-thinking organizations and communities that they spoke to and that they were part of in this larger progressive ecosystem here within the city of Boston, talking about how we center things like representation and equity right, in terms of everything that we do here in the city of Boston, making sure that we're thinking in particular of the least among us, those who often get overlooked or feel like their voices aren't heard, and making right. sure that they have that ability and have somebody who's going to advocate for them and provide them with that platform for even better advocacy for themselves. Now, it is say that normally when a young man decided to run, the admirations of other uh, young people is really enthusiastic and they want to join in and help out. How was that experience for you? Yeah, the first campaign, it was interesting, right? Nobody really knew me, uh, you know, of course, in certain civic circles, but in the broader sense, I, I was largely unknown. So I know as the campaign was going along, we saw more people that were connecting, which was great. In the second campaign, it was a little bit of a different challenge because while I did have a little bit of name recognition from the first race, we were also in the middle of COVID. And so there were just a lot of things that we wanted to do in terms of connecting that we either couldn't do or we had to be very creative about. So the first event that we had as a campaign was actually a summit on issues of young people here in the city of Boston. And it was really inspiring you know, to have individuals who were involved in other campaigns, things like uh, the Ed Markey for Senate campaign or the Sunrise Movement speaking, speaking about environmental issues, young people who are really intelligent who are really committed and really thoughtful about where the city is and where the city needs to go in terms of their future and their peers. Uh, so I was inspired by that. You know, I think back to a young man that I know, uh, Marcus McNeil, who was a member of Mayor Wu's transition team, actually, uh, later on. And he, I got to know him a little bit through our first campaign, and then he was a supporter and volunteer here in the second campaign. And it's been amazing to watch him as this dynamic young leader who has gone you know, taking it on himself in addition to working, in addition to being in school, but to be civically engaged because he really believes in it. Seeing somebody like Marcus and the work that they're putting in to make our city better in a lot of different ways, uh, he serves on the Boston Student Advisory Council as well, you know, really gives me a lot of hope for the city and for its future, far beyond you know, me as an individual or anything that I'm going to do, but really about the capacity and the power and the future that our young people represent. We are going to move on with the, the decisions of doing the second run. It's because you are convinced that you had done at least a very good job on the first one. And having the endorsement of so many was also very helpful. And I could tell you based on experience, too. Uh, the endorsement of Boston Globe is certainly not a joke. Uh, for you to achieve that, you've got to go through the test Another for you to get the there. Gauntlet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it's the best souvenir that I have in 2013 was when I get endorsed by them. But however, raising money is always the toughest hurdle. It is true, it's said in politics, it's not the money that's going to get you into the office. But without the money, also, you may not also get into the office. How is that in terms of community of color? who doesn't understand the concept to put their money where their mouth is. Uh, how, how is that to you? Well, you know, I wouldn't say that communities of color don't understand that. They definitely do. Uh, part of it is capacity, but there's a lot of money out there. You know, you have to know where to go and get after it. You know, it was a big difference in terms of fundraising between my first campaign and my second campaign. In my first campaign, I was a public employee. I was working at the Middlesex Sheriff's Office, and so as a public employee in Massachusetts, you're not allowed to do any direct fundraising. So it was all kind of second order. People had to ask on my behalf until I left my job during that campaign, and then I was able to, and our fundraising picked up, but it was already pretty deep into the campaign season, that part. Uh, from but when you're saying that you're not allowed to, to do any fundraising, 
personally, but other people could do per fundraising for you, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, you know, for example, if I was talking to somebody on the phone where you would normally end that conversation and maybe ask for a donation, you somebody else would literally have to take the phone from me and I make the ask in order to make sure that we were abiding by the law. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's important. We want to make sure that we're doing everything the right way, but it's a challenge. You know, there's nothing more compelling, people will tell you, and it's true, than the candidate themselves asking you for your vote, for support in any kind of a way. So when it's somebody else, it diminishes that to a little bit. So we were working around that. In my second campaign, I didn't have that restriction. And we saw nearly a threefold increase in terms of the money that we were able to raise as a campaign. A large part of that was the fact that I was able to do that work. Uh, and it was a lot of work and a lot of phone calls to a lot of people for a long time. It's unfortunate that money plays such an important role in our government and in our politics. You know, I'm a big supporter of the idea of publicly financed campaigns for that reason. Because every moment that you're spending on the phone talking to a donor, you know, regardless of whether you're trying to get $10 or $1,000 mm -hmm. out of them here in Massachusetts, those are minutes, those are moments that you're likely not talking to a voter, to somebody here in the city, somebody who has a concern, somebody who's worried that their child's school isn't going to have the kind of ventilation that it needs and it isn't a priority, it seems, on the list who are worried that their elderly relative is going to be pushed out of their home because they can't afford to make their tax payments anymore. Those are the kind of conversations we really should be having and not just, you know, those roll folded into and rolled into the context of asking something with an end point of can I ask you for $500, $1,000, whatever it is. So the more that we can do to get money out of politics in large part, uh, it won't never be completely removed, but the more we can do to minimize that role, I think the better it is because then it becomes more of a contest of ideas and about the things that people are bringing to the table, the skills, the qualities that they're bringing to the table as well, as opposed to just pegging it to say, oh, well, this person raised the most money. They're obviously the best qualified for this mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's not. Uh, we, we, we're getting closer to the end, but I wanted to be as sharp as possible. For the young folks who are out there who's watching and those who probably aspire to become politicians to the city of Boston, what would be your advice to them? Yeah. Well, the first thing is make sure you really want to do this. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it is an awful lot of work. Um, but second, make sure you want to do it for the right reasons. Like I said earlier, it's not about ego. It's not about just seeing your name on a Chiron in front of you on TV like this or making sure that you know, a reporter is going to call you because they think that it's going to be a cool story or something like that. It's about helping people. That needs to be the thing that you wake up thinking about in the morning. That needs to be the thing that drives you during the day and that you think about as you lay your head on your pillow eventually at night is every seat in government is a privilege and it is not something that you own. It's something that you were a steward of and the stewardship that you show in the best possible way is by making sure that you're using it to help as many people as you can to advance a good agenda that makes sure that the community that you are in is better tomorrow than it is today but not as good as it will be a few days after that. So making sure that you're really thinking about this for all of the right reasons. Making sure that you're listening to other people and including listening to people who don't agree with you. There's nothing that's more detrimental to good government or to healthy politics than just yes men all around you. People who only tell you that you know, you're wonderful, that you can't do anything wrong, that every idea you have is good because nobody's like that. There are no perfect people in this world. I'm certainly not one of them. And some of the best conversations that I had were often with friends but who had disagreements with me about you know, how we were thinking about ideas, how I was thinking about communicating some of those ideas as well. So making sure that you have those people that you can really count on and trust. And if you're in a relationship, if you are, have a family, anything like that, making sure that you're taking care of them. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how long you're in office. You're going to leave at some point. And when you do, hopefully that family's going to be around you. And so you need to make sure that you're taking care of them and preserving that relationship. One of the things I always tell friends who are thinking about running for office, particularly ones who are married or in long-term relationships, is have your partner, have your spouse talk to someone else that you know and their spouse about what the experience is. Because in many ways, there's campaigns are hardest on the people that you love because they see you, they care about you, they see the best in you, and hearing other people say <laughs> things about you that often aren't true or a little more pointed, and they don't really have the ability to you know, respond back, 
can be really yeah. hard. So making sure that you're doing that. It will be a strike to the heart, so just be careful with that, certainly. Uh, I gave it to you, the whole entire package. He really is a devoted uh, servant, and there's something that David expressed in here which is very, very detrimental. You're not running to become a lord. You are running to become a servant. So if you don't have that heart for it, don't even think about trying it. And it's not an exhibition where as your name will be coming out of the billboard or the newspapers and so on and so forth. So I think it's lesson learned and he has shared it with us today. So today I am going to say welcome to the bridge. And David is certainly going to be one of the hosts. And you'll be seeing my times interviewing people or co-hosting together with me throughout this program. Uh, he's an asset for our community, uh, a young man to look forward to, and like, uh, uh, what's her name said the other day, a rock star <laughs> <laughs> into the political arena. So a name to look out for, David Albert. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, you can charm the audience with just a little French of yours, <laughs> and we're going to close it right there. So take a bit at it. Whatever you could say in French to yeah. them, I think that would do it. Merci beaucoup, mon ami. Très bien, très bien. Okay. A pleasure, but ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are watching, uh, this is the end of the bridge for the moment. Uh, we're asking you to stay tuned because we'll have more programming coming up for you. Jean-Claude Sano, I'll see you later. Thank you. Soleil Levin, bonjour. Bonjour. Est-ce que nous sommes Est-ce que nous sommes dans l'air Non, pas moi, c'est Riz Vicentine, directeur, honneur, exécutif directeur, Soleil Levin. Je vous invite à un bel programme que nous avons dans la Cour Indolf avec Gandet Nouyo, Gandet Haïtien Nouyo. Pas oublier, nous sommes 100% pour ça Haïtien. Nous travaillons dans la communauté, nous servons la communauté. Nous allons vous inviter à voir tout ce qui a fait aujourd'hui dans le soleil levé. Tout ce qui a fait là, c'est ça nous fait dans le soleil levé et c'est ça nous fait chaque jour. Et avec l'autre activité toujours, nous mettons dans le soleil levé pour Gandet Nouyo, pour Gandet Haïtien Nouyo. Oui, j'ai un exercice la fête en dessous les levées. Exercice ça, c'est un exercice sur le vitamine B12. Et la vitamine ça, c'est que depuis que vous n'avez pas joué, vous avez perdu l'exercice ça, vous senti vous malade pour jouer. Deuxièmement, l'autre activité nouvelle, nous faisons bingo, nous faisons jouer domino, nous jouons 4, nous faisons toutes les activités, nous passons bins. Ils ont passé des tigres de riz avec poids. Ils ont fait toute qualité d'activité en dans le soleil. Nous avons fini, nous avons servi des nous snacks et nous avons de l'eau. Nous avons fait des snacks. Après ça, nous avons fait des kitchens, nous avons passé. Et dans les kitchens, nous avons fait des choses préparé et le staff qui a préparé là. William et, et, et Madame Regard qui a fait manger. Et Madame Maison qui a préparé, il a fait manger, il a rangé, il a clean. Et là, on passe dans le nursing, nous avons là où est le nursio. Nous avons le nursio, et M. Makula, David, et l'autre nursio, Nes Berlin, Nes Rosel, qui a fait un bon soin avec Gandet Nouyo. Et comparer le service ça avec l'autre, nous même avons travaillé, nous avons un bon service, nous avons un bon qualité de service, un bon bagage pour nous faire tout haïtien fier et de tête, de nous même, avec Gandet Nouyo. J'en ai servi Gandet Nouyo et Gandet Nouyo. L'aime de ça, nous pas oublier, nous dans la période, dans la période nous là, c'est une période qui est très fragile, c'est la période COVID-19. Tout le monde avec fait shield, yo gen marché, nous respecter tout principe social, ça vous demande, tout le guideline. Yo. Et alors, pour nous capables d'assurer nous que Gandet yo fait ça et vient dans le programme, j'ai eu venir, c'est comme ça vous retourner. C'est ça qui fait nous un petit slogan dans, nous pas prendre. Nous ne pas Le service de transportation avec un, 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 avec un, un directeur Manuel et l'autre chauffeur qui a, 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 a frappé la donne. Même si on est dans l'activité, le directeur Henri avec un directeur Rudy Coulange qui est, qui est floor manager qui a voulu monter, Jimmy qui a voulu monter. Adresse nous, c'est 61, Pleasant Street, Randolph, Massachusetts, 02368. Nous sommes là dans Randolph. Là. Ou quand nous tout dans 617 905 0341. Ou bien dans 617 932 76. Soleil levé, c'est pas, c'est pas, mais c'est pas tout haïtien. Mes amis, nous venons dans le soleil levé.